Okay, so in the last class, we have discussing about uh, the canonical form of second order principally linear PDE. Is it not? And then what we have seen that if you have a say hyperbolic equation, then you can use a change of variable formula, say xy goes to say zeta eta in a neighborhood of some point x0, y0, where at x0, y0 point uh, it is hyperbolic. Then the PD it reduces to this form uh, that u of zeta eta, which is some function of say zeta eta u u zeta and u eta. And not only that, what we have seen that zeta this is constant along the characteristic curve. Is it not? And eta is also constant along the characteristic equation. So, and I told you that to deduce in a canonical form, sometimes it is possible to find out the general solution. So, what happened? Suppose if you have say u of zeta eta, which is a function of only say zeta and eta in this case, for some cases. Then you can integrate with respect to zeta and then you can integrate with respect to eta. Then you have a function of, so if, if of the zeta is equal to some say function of zeta and eta, okay, some function of zeta and eta, then you can integrate, no? this is partial derivative. So you can integrate with respect to zeta, then what you have that you uh, at point say zeta eta, then you can have some function of f of zeta plus some g of eta. You know that is the general solutions. And then and then you convert your zeta eta into the xy variable, then you have a general solution for your given uh, second order principally linear PDE. That is the advantage that sometimes not all, but I'm saying that sometimes it is possible to find out the general solutions for this case because it says that eta zeta is equal to these things. Okay, so now suppose this is a function of zeta and eta so that you can integrate with respect to zeta and then again you can integrate with respect to eta, then you have in this form. Okay, so let us consider one example for that. So now find the general solution. And so this is called the general solution. Okay, I need to, I need to invert these things to xy variable, not the zeta eta variable, because initial, uh, initially your given PD is in the xy variable. So find the general solution of this PDE. I wrote down that say x u x x plus two x square u x y, which is equal to u x minus one. Okay. Now you see that uh, this PDE is hyperbolic provided that x is not equal to zero. Okay, x is not equal to zero, then it is hyperbolic. And what are the characteristic curve in this case? dy dx, so characteristic curve. In this case, I have this is 2x and 0. Okay, so from there actually if you just uh, you know solve this differential equation then what do we have y is equal to x square plus c and then y is equal to c. So that means I can think of my zeta xy which is x square minus y and then eta of xy which is y. Okay, and now if you no, consider uh, the derivative with respect to zero and eta, and then if you put it in your given PDE, then it reduces to in this form u of zeta eta, which is minus one by four zeta plus eta to the power minus three by two. Okay, now this is basically your canonical form. Okay, so now as I told you that u of zeta eta, it is a function of zeta and eta only, not the derivatives and, and so on. So this is a digital canonical form. 
so now if you integrate with respect to eta then what i have so from here i have so integrating with respect to eta what do you have you have a u of zeta this you see that this should be half of zeta plus eta to the power so 3 by 2 minus 3 by 2 and then you have minus half and then plus f of some zeta you have to integrate it so you have some zeta so now again if you integrate it with respect to eta then what you have so again you integrate then you have u which is zeta plus eta to the power half and then plus another may be f of zeta plus some g of eta okay so now this is a required uh, general equation if you just invert the zeta eta in terms of x and y so from here what you have zeta is equal to x square minus y it is equal to y so now if you put at zeta plus eta this is nothing but the x square so what you have that u of xy so the general solution u of xy this is nothing but so this one is uh, zeta plus eta to the power half this is x okay x and plus a pop now i have zeta which is x square minus y plus g of y where f and g are arbitrary functions okay so to reduce to in a canonical form sometimes uh, it is possible to find out the general solution okay not always but okay, okay so this is for your hyperbolic equation so then what about for the parabolic case what it says that so for the parabolic case what we have seen that we have only one characteristic is it no one characteristic curve because in that case dy dx that is actually is equal to your b by a okay so but if i try to change the coordinates x y goes to zeta and eta i need to find out my eta so then how to find out so zeta i know that okay zeta should be constant along your characteristic curve then what what is the choice of your eta so choice of eta is basically we need to change zeta such that my zeta eta defines a coordinate that's means the jacobian matrix so that's the determinant of the jacobian that should be uh, or jacobian matrix that's still non zero so that i can you know use the inverse function theorem i can change the coordinates so and in that case what it says that that the my given pde it reduces to in this form u of eta eta which is equal to again some uh, d tilde function of zeta eta u u zeta and u eta so in this case the change of coordinates is x y goes to my zeta eta zeta is constant along the characteristic curve and eta okay i need to choose such a such that my zeta eta defines a coordinate transformation that means that zeta x eta x zeta y eta y this is not equal to 0 near that point x0 y0 is it not because what it says that i have a given your uh, principally linear pde which is parabolic at point x0 y0 okay x0 y0 are that uh, the domain omega where your pd is parabolic on that domain then i need to find what i am saying that i can find a transformation or the coordinate transformation zeta eta near that point x0 y0 such that zeta is constant and eta i can choose such a way that the jacobian matrix is non zero near that point x0 y0 so that i can convert it and my given pd 
it is again remains a parabolic type and it reduces to in this form. In this form, okay. U of eta eta, which is a function of d zeta eta u, u zeta and u eta. Let us consider one example. So suppose I want to find the canonical form. of this PD, say x square u x x minus 2 x y u x y plus y square u y y which is equal to 0. Okay. Now you see that the PD is parabolic okay, everywhere on the, on the plane. Okay. At every point xy in my r2 okay so now i try to find out the canonical form uh, on omega which does not contain my origin because in origin actually it is uh, zero uh, zero is equal to zero form so i try to avoid the origin and then you look at that omega which does not contain the origin okay so then it is parabolic there and I try to find out the canonical form on, on that omega. So if you consider any x y x 0 y 0 point from that omega, then what I have to find out what is the characteristic curve in this case dy of dx, this is nothing but minus y by x, is it not? And hence I can take, so if you just solve these things, what it says that x of y is equal to constant. So I can put say zeta xy, which is actually x of y. Now I need to find out my eta such that the Jacobian is non-zero. So I am taking eta, which is equal to say y. If you take eta is equal to y, then you see that Jacobian actually non-zero because this is actually is equal to minus x which is non-zero because it does not contain the origin. Okay. So, what I try to find out that with this transformation zeta and eta, then if you find out my PDE, it reduces to in this form x square u eta eta minus 2 x y u zeta is equal to zero that is again if you transfer this thing so then what i have u of eta eta which is equal to 2 of zeta by eta square because eta square is equal to y square from here what i have and then u of zeta okay so this is your required canonical form for the parabolic case okay so now for the elliptic case what we know there is no real uh, characteristic, is it not? So then idea is you try to solve that differential equation in a complex plane. Okay. And uh, now suppose, so uh, for the parabolic, uh, for the elliptic case, So no real characteristics, no, we know. Then what is the idea basically? Idea is you solve your ODE, dy dx, which is equal to, uh, you know, that b xy minus root over of b square minus ac by a. So in the complex plane. Okay. And now suppose phi is, is constant along this characteristic. So the solution phi, which is complex now, it's not the real. Now complex, this is complex. This is constant along the characteristic. So then I am considering zeta eta zeta of xy which is real part of my phi of xy 
and eta of xy which is imaginary part of three of xy okay so then this zeta eta is the required uh, coordinate transformation and under this transformation our principally linear second order pde it reduces to in this form u of eta eta plus u of zeta zeta because it should be on a uh, elliptic type is again some function of zeta eta u u zeta and u eta okay so what it says that for the elliptic case there is no real characteristic so then idea is you try to solve your characteristic equation in a complex plane and suppose such solution is phi and uh, phi is constant along the characteristic and then you consider zeta which is a real part of phi xy and eta which is an imaginary part of phi xy then this zeta eta defines a coordinate transformation and under this transformation your original pde reduces to in this form u of eta eta plus u zeta zeta which is equal to function of zeta eta u u zeta and u eta and this is a in the, in the following canonical form okay so let us consider one example and then i will stop this chapter and then i will start the new one so you consider the equation u x x plus x square u y y is equal to zero okay so now you see that except y axis it is elliptic okay so equation is elliptic except say y axis okay so now if you try to solve the characteristic equation so what is your characteristic equation in this case dy dx so that is actually b b in this case is equal to 0 and then you have actually this is plus minus i times of x okay so if you solve this characteristic equation complex plane then you check that phi if i consider which is equal to y plus i of x square by 2 okay so this is because if you solve it y is equal to i of x square by 2 in the complex plane hence phi is equal to y plus i x square by 2 is constant okay is constant along the characteristic curve okay or the length of characteristics so in that case what i have to consider zeta x y which is real part of my phi which is nothing but actually y okay and eta i have to consider which is the imaginary part of phi this is nothing but your x square by 2 okay so now i get zeta and eta and then you know how to reduce your uh, given pd with respect to uh, the derivative in terms of zeta and eta so you check that the required canonical form is something like that u zeta zeta plus u eta eta plus 1 by 2 eta u of eta is equal to 0 okay okay so so this is all about our second order pde uh, and so on so they are actually basically first we try to find out what is the type of pde how to find out the type of pde depending on the uh, look at the characteristics and and so on and then actually we try to reduce in the canonical form and then the canonical form is sometimes useful to find out uh, general solutions of your given PDE. So now we will talk about a particular important PDE that is called the Laplace equation. So in particular, we try to study something like that, that Laplace of u is equal to 0, that is called the Laplace equations, or sometimes minus Laplace u is equal to given a, this is called the Poisson equation. Okay, and with maybe uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition or the Neumann boundary condition, it is given to you that I will discuss it. Okay, so this is kind of the Poisson equation, and this is called the Laplace equation. So it is of elliptic type, no? 
left plus of u is equal to zero, which is nothing but the u means if it is in a second variable, so u x x plus u of y y is equal to zero in the two variable. So here we try to uh, look at in a general uh, domain, okay, in a, in R n. Okay, so let us try to recall the divergence theorem and also the Green's theorem, which is useful to find out the solutions to this problem and so on. So what is the divergence theorem? So now suppose I have a domain omega, which is a open bounded domain in Rn. Okay, and then del omega, this is nothing but the boundary. Okay, of the boundary of the domain. Okay, so divergence theorem, what it says that, that if you have say u and v, which may be uh, C2, and C1 of omega closure may be, okay, then integral over omega, u plus v of dx, this is called la plus v dx, plus integral over omega get u dot get v of dx. This is nothing but over del omega u do v do eta d sigma. So this is a in the right hand side left right hand side this is a surface integral. This is a surface measure. And what is your do v do eta? This is nothing but uh, so eta is the uh, outward uh, unit normal. Okay. And do v do eta is nothing but the eta dot get of v. Okay, so this one is eta dot get v. Okay, so it's kind of the integration by parts formula for a particular case if you will see. It. And what is the Green's theorem? Again, I can deduce from here the Green's theorem that is called the Green's theorem. Now the same assumption if u v is in C2 omega and C on omega closure, then I can say that integral over low omega v do u do eta minus u do v do eta of d sigma this is the surface integral this is same as integral over omega i have v laplace u minus u laplace v of dx dx why i am considering this uh, green's theorem and uh, the divergence theorem you will see that because i want to solve this problem with with initial with boundary condition okay maybe if i am considering on say on a bounded domain omega this equation holds in a bounded domain omega and then suppose it is given to you say u is equal to some g on del omega or do u do nu is equal to some h okay on do omega so this is the under first condition this we call the Dirichlet really problem and under second condition that is called the Neumann problem. Okay, so now we'll see that if this problem has a solution, then it should satisfy some compatibility conditions that it will come from the Green's theorem or the divergence theorem. You can use uh, whatever uh, it is there. Okay, so in particular, suppose uh, I have a solution for this problem. Okay, minus la plus a is equal to a in omega and say do u do nu is equal to h on do omega. So then what I have here, so what I'm saying that suppose I have a solution minus la plus u is equal to f in omega and do u do nu which is equal to some g or uh, I put as a h on del omega. Okay, suppose you use a solution, then what I can think of here. Now if you integrate my equation, first equation, that means what I have So what I have minus la plus u dx over omega. This is actually integral over omega of f dx. Is it not? So now you just look at here. Okay, from here. So now if you put suppose u is equal to identically one, so that it satisfies your these conditions in your divergence theorem. If you put ident u is equal to identically one, then what it say that la plus b integral over omega La plus v dx is nothing but integral over omega dou v dou eta of d sigma. Is it not? 
so then this is nothing but minus so if you put it here then this part is zero so you have integral over do omega now do you do eta d sigma which is given to you h so now this is h of d sigma this should be integral over omega f of dx okay so now if you consider say f is equal to zero then what it says that integral over dou omega h of d sigma that is actually is equal to zero means the averaging over our del omega it should be zero if your this neumann problem has a solution okay so that is directly coming from your uh, divergence theorem okay the particular form of divergence theorem because i am using say e is equal to identically one in this case and considering equation is in v okay so this is important to find out the solutions okay so before going to the solution concept and all these things we just try to consider because i wrote down that laplace u is equal to zero okay so whenever you have u which is say c2 on omega so omega is given to you which is open bounded domain then i say that it is harmonic if laplace u is equal to zero for all x is in omega so that is my definition and then i talk about the certain properties of harmonic functions and so on uh, and then i'll come back to uh, our pd part okay so what i'm saying that omega which is subset of rn this is open bounded domain or uh, we don't need boundedness here at least but it is in open set in rn and we say that u is in c2 of omega okay is called harmony if laplace u of x is equal to 0 for all x is in omega okay so laplace u x is equal to 0 it is harmony so in particular if you look at if you consider say constant function then it is harmony or if you consider this a first order polynomial okay so then that is also uh, harmonic is it no first order polynomial means basically if you look at say u of x is equal to so for example constant function is uh, is trivially harmonic functions no if i consider that u of x which is something like some i is equal to 1 to n a i of x i okay this is a polynomial then it is harmonic you will see that it is a harmonic function and not only that one can show it that is a big kind of theorem that u u is harmonic function on rn on whole rn then it should be either constant or it is a first order polynomial so i can say as a remark that if u is harmonic in rn then either u is constant or it is a first order polynomial okay it is a first order polynomial okay so now we try to find out certain properties of harmonic function some important properties of harmonic function so in particular here we are considering say u is in open set open and bounded okay so i, I put as a omega theorem that is called the maximum principle so basically what it says that that if you have a harmonic function on a bounded domain okay so what i'm saying that suppose u is in c2 omega intersection c of omega closure okay that means it is u is continuously extendable on your closure of omega where omega is in open and bounded domain then the maximum of u it attains at boundary okay so this is a harmonic function 
So let be a harmonic function in U. That means Laplace of U is equal to zero. Okay. So then the following properties holds that maximum over U of omega closure. This holds no because U is continuous, omega closure is compact. So we know that continuous functions as a uh, you know it attains its maximum. So now it says that maximum principle says that this maximum it attains at boundary, which is maximum of do u of q. Okay. So boundary it is closed and then bounded. So also u attains the maximum there. So what it says that maximum of u over omega closure is same as the maximum of u over del of omega. Sorry. Del of omega. Okay. And second thing what it says that this is called the weak, generally it is called the weak maximum principle. This one is called the weak maximum principle. And second one, what it says that if U is connected, so under this assumption, so additionally, if omega is connected, okay, then and suppose the maximum attempts at in at, at the interior point and there exists a x0 belongs to omega such that u of x0 which is equal to maximum of omega closure of u so that's mean maximum attempts at any interior point then u is constant. Within omega. Okay. Then u is constant within omega. This is important. The connectedness is important. So what it says that the maximum of any harmonic function it attains in general it is in the boundary point but if it is attained in a the minimum uh, the maximum attains at uh, interior point and if your omega is connected then omega must be constant within omega that is within omega okay so let us prove the theorem so proof is simple idea so for one dimensional case what do we know that suppose at some point x0 some function has a maximum then the what i have if it is a smooth function then what do we know that the first derivative is equal to zero and then the second derivative should be less than or equal to zero is it not for the maximum case and for the minimum case it is greater equal to zero so we try to use that function that if it is in the interior point then we have that less than or equal to zero. Okay. So we try to find out a function V such that the second derivative of V that is strictly positive. That means basically maximum it cannot attain in interior point. Is it not? So that is the idea. Okay, so if u has a maximum at an interior point, then Laplace of u less than or equal to zero, no? Because Laplace of u is nothing but summation over i is equal to one to n do square u do x square. So Laplace of u in a n variable is nothing but i is equal to one to n do square u do x square. Is it not? So if that u has a maximum at interior point, then my Laplace of u should be less than or equal to zero, is it not? So therefore, if I have a function v such that my Laplace v is positive, then the maximum value of v, it cannot be attained in interior point, is it not? 
okay so that means b should attain its maximum only on the boundary of del omega so for that i am defining that given epsilon is positive you define your v epsilon x which is equal to my u of x plus epsilon times mod of x square by number x is in my omega okay so then you check that because u is in c2 of omega intersection c of omega closure then my v it is also c2 omega intersection c of omega closure okay and not only that you see that laplace of v epsilon this is strictly positive on omega is it not because this is 2 epsilon laplace of u is equal to 0 this part is 2 of epsilon so i have this is strictly positive because epsilon is positive so that the b attains its maximum only on the boundary so this implies b epsilon attains maximum on del omega okay so i am just considering that m which is maximum of u over del omega and l which is a maximum of, of of my function mod x square on del omega so then what i have that v epsilon of x okay if x is in my omega then this is less than or equal to maximum of omega closure of v epsilon is it not now this one actually already we have seen that v epsilon attain its maximum on del omega so these things and then now if you look at here v epsilon x is equal to v epsilon x plus epsilon of mod x square then i can find out this v epsilon x this is less than or equal to my m plus epsilon times l because m is the maximum over u maximum uh, maximum of u over del omega and l is the maximum of mod x square over del omega so i have m plus epsilon of l and this holds for all x is in my omega is it not so that means what i have now u u of x is always less than equal to v of x so what i have u of x this is less than equal to m plus epsilon times l because u of x is less than equal to v epsilon x v epsilon x is nothing but u v epsilon x is equal to nothing but u x plus epsilon times mod x square okay so this holds for all x is in omega and now epsilon is arbitrary which is positive so i can take epsilon you know tends to zero so then what i have u of x is less than equal to m okay so that means what that means so this implies m is nothing but your maximum of u over del omega so i can think of this implies maximum of u over omega closure this is exactly is maximum over u of del omega that is actually m is it done okay so this is the this is your first part to prove the second part i need some kind of uh, 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 property that is called the mean value property for harmonic function so i am stating that property that is called the mean value property of harmonic function so to prove my part 2 i need the following theorem so that is called the mean value theorem and it's converse so what it says that now suppose u is in my c2 of omega it is harmonic okay now if i consider a ball with radius r such that it is contained in my set omega okay so this is your omega 
I can find out no this ball, this ball, or whatever it is constant in that. Constant, it is basically inside in your omega. So then what it says that that I can write down my u of x. This is actually one by sigma of dou b of x. This is boundary and then the measure. OK, measure. This is basically the boundary measure and then integral over dou b of x and then u y d sigma y. So if you try to find out the value of u x at any point x, such that ball of x r, there exists r such that ball of x r, you know, contained in omega, you can consider any ball around that. Then sigma of x is nothing but basically the averaging of that. Okay. Ball of x r, sigma y, and these things not only I can write down, this is nothing but ball of x r, this is the measure of that. And then integral over ball of x r u of y d of y. Okay, so as I said, that sigma which is the surface measure. So if u is harmonic, then I can write down that u of x in, in this form, that is integral form. Okay, so now what about the converse? So conversely, If u is in say C2 omega, satisfy the following property. So in particular, I'm just considering the first part. You can also consider the second part also. 1 by sigma dou b of xr integral over dou b over xr u y d sigma y. This should hold for each ball of xr this is containing omega then u is harmonic this is one uh, important property of a harmonic function that is called the mean value property okay so now i will try to use this mean value property to prove my strong maximum principle whatever i say that if you have a u which is harmonic function u is in c2 omega integration c of omega closure and if you attain its maximum at interior point and if your omega which is connected then you must be constant so to prove the part two what it says that that there exists x0 is in omega such that my u of x0 which is equal to m that actually maximum over omega closure of u. OK. So now then I can find out R, which is basically distance from this x0 and then del of omega. So that if you consider any x, OK, if you consider any x and if you look at the ball, then actually that ball contain in your uh, omega. So then by the mean value property, what it says that m which is equal to my u of x0, this actually by mbt, this thing I can write down 1 by ball of x0 and r and then integral over ball of x0 r and then u y over d y. So now u of y, this is less than or equal to m, is it not? So what I have, this is less than or equal to, this is m, less than or equal to m, so I can take m and then this is the measure and then ball of measure, so this is less than or equal to m. So that means what? So this implies u of x0, which is this part, I have that u of any y, okay, this should be actually is equal to m for all y is in ball of x0 of r. So now I try to use this thing. If you consider say omega 1, which is my all those x is in omega such that my u of x is equal to m. Because I, I, I saw only that u of y is equal to m only on that 
ball. Okay, but I try to show that this is omega one, which is again open and and uh, closed, and you have a connected component. Hence, it is should be omega, whole omega. Okay. So now we check that e one, which is both open and closed in omega, and e is uh, at that omega. As I told you in my part two, I have considered the connected. That means my omega one is equal to omega. So that means e is constant, which is actually is equal to n. So there I am using the mean value property to prove it that if you have a harmonic function and it is continuously extended to omega closure, and if the maximum of u attains in interior point and omega is connected then you must be constant in omega okay so i you see that laplace uh, laplace of u is equal to 0 you no know? if i replace by say u by minus u then that is also Laplace of minus u is also zero. This is nothing but the minus of Laplace u is equal to zero. So the previous theorem, okay, I can do it for u replaced by minus of u. So that means so now you have your maximum. So then actually it should be replaced by minimum. Is it not? Because u is harmonic. So I can say. This is the maximum principle, then I can consider the minimum principle that if u is a harmonic, then minimum of u over omega closure, this is it is attained on the minimum over del omega. So as a consequence, if u belongs to C2 omega intersection C of omega closure is harmonic, then Minimum of u over omega closure, this should be minimum of u over del omega. Okay. And then you can see also the similar things there. If the minimum attains at a interior point, any omega is connected, then u is constant. Okay. Okay. So let us consider one example. So let u of x y is equal to x square minus y square. Okay, on omega is equal to all those x y's in my R two such that x square plus y square is less than one. Okay, so you have this is your origin, this is your length one. Okay, so omega is open bounded domain, so inside things, and what is your boundary? That is nothing but this circle. Okay, so now you see that u is harmonic. Is it not? Here you check that u is harmonic because Laplace of u, which is actually is equal to zero. And what will be the maximum of u over omega closure? This is basically maximum thing should be one. Is it not? Maximum thing should be one, and which is attained at the boundary one zero point or, or minus one zero point. Okay, and now if you consider the minimum of u over omega closure, this is nothing but the minus one, and now you see that it attains again at the boundary. Which is zero one point or zero minus one point. Okay, you just you know look at the graph, and from there also you can also find out. Okay, so it is a harmonic function, hence it at an, and omega you have the nice domain it is given to you. So the maximum of u attains in the boundary, and minimum also it attains in the boundary. 
ओके सो आई नीड टू डिफाइन नॉट डिफाइन बेसिकली आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू प्रूव इट बट आई एम जस्ट गोइंग टू स्टेट इट दैट द हार्मोनिक फंक्शन शॉर्ट एवर वी रोड डाउन इट इज एक्चुअली सी इनफिनिटी फंक्शन सो व्हाट इट सेज दैट दैट इफ आई गिव यू ए कंटिन्यूस फंक्शन यू on omega such that it satisfy the mean value property okay then u is c infinity omega so as a theorem i can write down that let u belongs to it is just given that continuous on omega and satisfy the mean value property that is that u of x can be written as 1 by sigma do b of xr integral over do b of xr u y d sigma y where sigma is the surface measure and this should hold for all ball this is contain in my set omega then u is c infinity of omega this is really really a nice property so proof of the uh, idea of the proof is basically one needs to reduce the change of variable formula and then uh, because if you try to put u in c infinity first try to look at the u x i whether it is c infinity or not and so on okay so i'm not going to prove that but if you just uh, try to look at the proof on all these things so you can look at the note uh, by professor sinath uh, you just go back to his website then there is a uh, course called the partial differential equations and then you look at the elliptic equation okay so proof is there so what it says it is really really a uh, important property of a harmonic function that if u is in continuous function on a given omega and if it is satisfy mean value property then u is harmonic and hence it is c infinity so that means i can say that harmonic functions are c infinity functions and not only that since it is a c infinity function one can find out the derivative so in particular i wrote down d alpha of u over x0 so you know the d alpha notation so initially you know i is that part this is less than equal to some constant ck by r to the power n plus k integral over ball of x0 over r mod of u y dy okay and this is what is your ball of x0 r as i say that this should be containing your omega for all ball of x0 and this d alpha this is the multi indices so mod alpha is equal to k and what is your constant ck now c0 this is 1 by alpha of n and ck this is depending on uh, that n and k to the power n plus 1 nk to the power k by alpha n for k is equal to 1 2 and so on and what is your alpha n this is nothing but the major of unit ball okay which is i can think of 1 by n integral over this is s of n minus 1 which is the sphere over d sigma okay so what it says that basically if i have a harmonic function then it is smooth function not only that the derivative at any point say x0 i have the following Uh, i can bound in in this following manner okay and indeed all the harmonic function are real analytic you know the definitions of real analytic so all the uh, harmonic functions are real analytic okay so here we don't need to find out the real analytic and so on but at least this kind of property i need later on so what i try to say is the following that if i give you any bounded harmonic functions on rn then it is constant so as a remark i say that harmonic functions in rn either it is constant or polynomial 
Is it not? So now polynomial cannot be bounded. Polynomial, the first order polynomial can cannot be bounded. So that means any bounded harmonic functions on Rn, it should be constant, no? But the proof actually it is coming. Just I try to use this form. How it is going on? This theorem is called the Lively theorem. Lively's theorem. What it says that any bounded harmonic function on Rn is constant. Okay. Let us prove these things. This is, as I said, that that proof. I should use this derivative things. What it says that if you look at that u x i over any x because u is harmonic on whole R n, so this ball of x zero r that is always you know subset of R n. So u of x i, then this should be less than equal to your c one. Is it not? Because mod alpha is equal to one in this case. So c one by r two to the power n plus one. Here, if you look at k is equal to one. So mod alpha here mod alpha is equal to k. No. So k is equal to one. I am considering, and then integral over ball of x r and then mod of u y d y. This is given to you here. Okay. So now u is bounded. Suppose mod of You uh, that means I can find out the supremum of these things, you no? Know? So this is less than equal to supremum of or say mod u, and then c1 by r to the power n plus one, and then I have ball of xr. So now ball of xr, this is same as my r to the power n times ball of zero one, the measure of ball of zero one, you no? Know? The measure of ball of xr, this is actually uh, because this measure is translation things, so r to the power n times ball of zero one. So now you see that this is one by r is coming, c one is constant, this is constant. So this goes to zero as my r goes to infinity. So that means what I am saying here, this means my u x i of x, this is identically zero. Okay, and since x is arbitrary, that means all the you no know, the partial derivative that is actually equal to zero. And now I have in whole R n which is connected, hence u is constant. So this implies u is constant. You know the connect connected set is important, no? Because you can find out something like that. I have a say function which is smooth on this domain, this domain, this domain. Here it is constant. Derivative is constant in this domain, this domain, this domain. Are, if I consider say omega one, omega two, and omega three. If I take it, omega is equal to omega one union omega two union omega three, so this holds, no? But U is not constant. So, but this is here because we are in a whole R n, so which is connected, hence actually U is constant. Okay. So this is called the Lubitsch theorem, and I will stop now. What it says that any bounded harmonic function in R n is constant. Okay. and we'll talk about more on poisson process and then we'll consider the fundamental solutions for that problem and how to solve uh, the pd and so on okay so i'll stop now